Hello and welcome to uh, everyone who is joining us here on behalf of the uh, Arrhythmia Academy. Uh, my name is Jonathan Bihar, uh, cardiologist from St Thomas's in London, and it's my privilege to uh, be joining you and chairing this session uh, alongside our uh, esteemed editor-in-chief, Professor Angelo Arricchio. Uh, and together we are uh, discussing a really important and everyday topic um, which you all deal with on a daily basis, the implantable cardioverted defibrillator and the choice that we have between subcutaneous and transvenous devices. Uh, we have a really uh, phenomenal uh, international panel here of, uh, of two uh, experts, Professor Haran Berry and Professor Pierre Lambiaze, um, who will do both separate talks on the merits and, uh, and drawbacks of both the transvenous ICD and the subcutaneous ICD. And then that will uh, lead us into a nice discussion afterwards. Uh, we hope that it is insightful and helpful and thought provoking for you. Uh, so with that in mind, Angelo, if you'd like to in, uh, introduce the, uh, the first speaker. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, John. It is really also my distinct privilege and honor to welcome all of you uh, to this uh, very interesting um, uh, session. And also I uh, join um, in the congratulating also both uh, Haran and, uh, and uh, Pierre Lambiaze for, uh, Haran Buri and Pierre Lambiaze for uh, uh, making themselves available for this uh, uh, nice um, uh, debate. And uh, I'm very happy to introduce now to you, uh, Professor Haran Buri. He is the Director of Cardiac Pacing at Geneva University, and he's very much involved in uh, a number of guidelines and documents, all dealing with uh, cardiac implantable um, uh, defibrillators and, and, uh, and pacemakers. So a very prominent person, a very talented uh, uh, colleague, and it's really my uh, pleasure to, uh, to have Arden with us. And please, Arden, start with your presentation about uh, really transvenous ICD, what we have learned and what we should not do probably in the, for, in the future. Thank you very much, uh, Angelo, for the kind introduction and the invitation to this uh, interesting uh, seminar here. So I've been asked to cover a general overview of transvenous ICDs. Uh, these are my disclosures. And just a single slide on the history of ICDs, which have now been around for over 40 years. Uh, Michael Mirosky, who you see on the right of the screen, uh, was the person who really developed ICDs, which were implanted for the very first time in 1980 in the US. This was done using epicardial leads and thoracotomy. A few years later, transvenous ICDs with anti Brady pacing were introduced. And uh, a few years later, still in the early 1990s, uh, the devices were able to deliver ATP, which I think was really the big game changer in ICD therapy. And we're currently in the fourth generation of ICDs. Uh, and, and these devices now do so much more than just treat uh, um, uh, tachyarrhythmias. They're able to be remotely monitored and uh, deliver heart failure therapy with CRT and also have really advanced diagnostics. So to start off with ATP, um, we know now since many years, these are data coming back from 2004, that the majority of the tachyarrhythmias which are diagnosed by ICDs are amenable to painless ATP therapy which is um, successful in the great majority of these ventricular tachycardias. More recently, we know that if we increase the numbers of uh, ATP bursts or ramps which are delivered, we can significantly reduce the uh, requirements for painful shocks. For VT, if we program at least three ATP sequences, then the proportion of uh, shocked episodes goes down to less than 5%. And for fast VT episodes, this goes down to about 13%. So you see painless and effective therapy in the majority of these episodes. This is also shown from another series uh, very recently published here, uh, which shows that if you increase the numbers of bursts and maybe add ramps as well, 
then you can significantly reduce the requirements for painful shock therapy. Um, just maybe also a slide just to explain how ATP works, because I think many of us don't quite understand. We know it works, but we don't exactly know how. Basically, when an ICD delivers ATP, uh, what you want is to have a collision of the wavefront with the tail of the, um, of the circuit. So basically, it reaches refractory tissue. And what you want is that the uh, tissue, which is at the head of the VT circuit, becomes refractory thanks to the ATP uh, delivery. So basically, there's a collision of the wavefronts, and this extinguishes the ventricular arrhythmia. This is going to depend on the number of pulses to reach the circuit and the distance of the, um, of the lead from the VT circuit. Uh, also, the timing needs to be appropriate so that the, there is that collision of the wavefronts. And it also will depend quite a bit on the size of the excitable gap. So that's basically the electrophysiology of it, which is currently being evaluated in this new form of ATP called intrinsic AP ATP, which is developed by one of the manufacturers, which takes on a very electrophysiological view on how ATP works and basically um, adapts the, uh, the ATP based on the return cycles. So if there's a failure to reset from the first ATP burst, then it's going to add an extra um, beat to the drive cycle to try and penetrate the circuit. If it then diagnoses a reset of the um, arrhythmia, but without interruption of the arrhythmia, then what's going to happen is it's going to shorten the extra pulse coupling interval to try and, 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 and then um, achieve this collision of the wavefront. So very e electrophysiological view, which we have to still see if it's going to be any more effective than the current ATB therapies which we have. Moving on now to shocks. Um, we know that uh, shocks, uh, be they appropriate or inappropriate, are painful uh, for the patient. And we know that uh, inappropriate shocks are also associated with a significantly increased hazard ratio of death. We don't really know if it's a marker or a factor for uh, increased mortality. And we know from uh, data that comes, that dates since over 15 years, that uh, the rate of inappropriate shocks back then was really high. It was a real problem in our daily practice to have patients with inappropriate shocks. Uh, as you can see from uh, these data coming from MADIT2, there was over 10% of patients had inappropriate shocks over a follow-up of about three and a half years. And in fact, about a third of all shocks were actually inappropriate. Now the PIX has really changed over the last few years. We know that if we increase the duration of detection in the programming, we can significantly reduce the numbers, not only of inappropriate shocks, but also of appropriate shocks, simply because a lot of these arrhythmias actually may be non-sustained and may terminate spontaneously before requiring actually a shock. This has also been shown by the MADIT RIT trial that shows that if you uh, increase the um, duration of therapy, as you said, delayed therapy, or if we increase the rates at which therapy is delivered, we can significantly reduce inappropriate therapy and actually also significantly reduce death. So better ways of programming our devices, uh, which we've learned over the last few years to deliver better therapy. And there's this very nice study by our chair today, uh, Angelo Riccio, that shows that the rate of inappropriate shocks with transvenous ICDs is now, with all the current suite that we have with the uh, detection algorithms, the risk of inappropriate shocks is only down to about 2% per year. So I think that's the sort of benchmark that we should be expecting from ICD therapy today. Uh, we also know that with remote monitoring, we can uh, significantly also reduce the risk of inappropriate shocks by diagnosing lead failure earlier and also maybe um, rapidly conducted AFib and intervene before a shock gets delivered. Now with transvenous ICDs, we have a wealth of data out there uh, in over 10,000 patients, 10,000 patients who are in randomized controlled trials on ICD therapy and on CRT as well comparing ICD with CRTD, ICD with medical therapy, 
you see the different studies which are listed here. So I would say a very highly evidence-based therapy. We also have the possibility beyond CRT nowadays to offer conduction system pacing in patients who require pacing and who have an ICD implanted. And that's an alternative, I would say, to CRT. And this is perfectly possible with the ICD, um, ICDs that we have currently, where we can implant, we can actually connect the uh, CSP lead to the LV port if required. Now we know that a significant proportion of our patients who have ICDs implanted will require pacing therapy or an upgrade to CRT. We know that this is about 5% of patients after a median follow-up of 20 months. These are data uh, coming from MADIT2. So it's about one in 20 patients, which is not frequent, but it's not exceptional. And that's something I think we also have to bear in mind if we're considering therapies such as subcutaneous ICDs. Now, as I mentioned, ICDs nowadays do much more than just deliver anti-tachycardia therapy. We have a very valuable diagnostic tool which is implanted in our patients, which can monitor surrogates for lung fluid, of course, arrhythmias, be it atrial arrhythmias, thanks to the presence of an atrial lead, or ventricular arrhythmias. We can look at heart rate variability. We can even diagnose um, the amplitude of the S3 and the S1, thanks to the accelerometer, which is embedded in the, in the, in the generator. And this also gives us markers for uh, heart failure. We can look at uh, the respiratory rate and also daily activity. And these also are tools which help us monitor our patients with heart failure. There's, however, a flip side to any coin. And the flip side with transvenous ICDs is definitely um, are shown here. And as what you can see is that there's a relatively frequent uh, problem of venous stenosis or, or occlusion, which is in about 10 to 15% of patients. In the great majority of patients, it's completely asymptomatic because we have collaterals uh, which form, but it can be an issue if you want to upgrade uh, your device or to, uh, or to add a new lead. Of course, during the implantation, there's a risk of pneumothorax you see on the top right panel, uh, which is mainly an issue with subclavian vein puncture and much less so with the other venous techniques, uh, access techniques. There's a risk also of perforation um, with tamponade, especially from the atrial lead. Uh, so that does occur, um, thankfully, in a small minority of patients, but it's a life-threatening complication. The ventricular lead traverses the tricuspid valve and can uh, interfere with the function of the tricuspid valve and sometimes lead to severe tricuspid regurgitation, which may exceptionally re require surgical repair. And of course, we have the usual complications, which are hematoma, and um, uh, what we dread a lot, of course, is infection. Um, and finally, also, we have lead failure. And this is a slide which you see very often shown. I've seen this, I don't know how many times in Congresses, uh, this series in which the risk of lead dysfunction is about 40% after eight years. That's huge. So these are old data, um, and it certainly does not reflect what we have nowadays. I think it's important to note that in this series, almost all of these leads were implanted by subclavian vein puncture, which I'll come back to is not the way to implant leads today. In any case, we can be, I think, very happy that we don't see such a high rate of lead failure of transvenous leads today. In fact, I'll just show you one of the product performance reports that comes from Boston Scientific, which is also the manufacturer of the uh, current SICD, where we have a lead survival rate of 98% at 10 years. So we also have an excellent track record of these leads. And this lead, by the way, is guaranteed for life. So it's a very robust, a very, an excellent lead. And certainly doesn't reflect the data which I showed you previously. Coming back to lead implantation, I think we can, of course, blame the material, but we say that a bad workman blames his tools. And I think that there sometimes are bad workmen out there 
and we can do a better job with uh, implanting the, the devices using cephalic venous cut down or rather than subclavian vein puncture. And we have good data that show that uh, lead survival is much better with cephalic venous cut down or also with auxiliary vein puncture compared to subclavian vein puncture. So very good data on alternative methods. And this is the reason why in our consensus document, which we recently published, uh, we gave um, uh, axillary vein puncture or cephalic vein venous cut down as a preferred venous access route with a green heart. So this is the way to go rather than subclavian vein puncture, which really should be a bailout solution. Nevertheless, lead fractures do occur. I think some of you may remember the problems we had with the Fidelis lead fractures, which was a real problem. And um, it, at box change, it was always a dilemma to know what we were going to do with our Fidelis lead. Should we replace it or not? If we just change the box, then the, the risk of an appropriate shocks was very high, about 15% at 10 years, and as was also the risk of re-intervention. Thankfully, with um, transvenous leads and especially DF1 leads, we have alternatives. This is one way of, um, of dealing with box changes in leads which have recalls. If you have a DF1 connector and a CRTD, for instance, you can simply exchange the IS1 port of the LV lead uh, with the IS1 uh, connector of the, of the RV lead and thereby avoid uh, inappropriate shocks. This of course is not possible with DF4 leads. And this is one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of DF4 connectors. For instance, you can't downgrade if you have a super responder or a very elderly patient who has a CRTD in whom you want to downgrade to a CRTP. Uh, in addition to these little tricks that you can use to avoid inappropriate shocks at box change, uh, I think currently the uh, manufacturers have come up with very good algorithms that compare near field and far field signals and thereby recognize that there may be an issue with lead fracture and uh, very successfully withhold inappropriate shocks and thereby bring down the risk of this complication. So in conclusion, uh, transvenous ICDs have a very high success rate of ATP, painless therapy, and really reduce the risk of uh, requiring unnecessary shocks. Uh, there's a very low rate nowadays of inappropriate shocks, about 2% per year. Um, many patients actually will require anti-bradi pacing, about one in 20, or CRT. And we can also propose conduction system pacing with these patients. Um, these devices have advanced diagnostic functions, which can help us better manage our patients. Uh, but there's nevertheless a need really to minimize lead related complications. First of all, perhaps by improving technology, making leads more robust, maybe reducing the adhesions of these leads and the propensity to thrombose veins. Uh, that's where biocompatible materials, I think, need to make some headway. But also, very importantly, what we can do as physicians is improve our implantation technique to really reduce the um, inappropriate uh, the, the side effects of this therapy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Hanan. This was really uh, a phenomenal presentation. I think you really um, uh, provided all good reasons, I would say, why we should stay with um, ICD. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, your uh, uh, antagonist, if I may call him uh, in this way, I, I think we also will have a good number of arguments for that. 